Hello, Faithful. I'm so happy to invite to Bad Faith Podcast for the first time, Steve Marr. He is the assistant professor of economics at SUNY Cortland and a co-editor of the Socialist Register. Welcome to Bad Faith, Steve. Thanks. Good to be here. So I was introduced to you after listening to an episode of Macro and Cheese, a favorite podcast of mine, strong recommendation from Jonathan Cadman there. So shout out to him for keying me into that podcast. And I really appreciated that you were a very clear communicator on the subject of economics, which I will fully admit uh, is not a class I ever took in college. (laughs) Um, I was introduced to kind of having a bit of an interest in it because I had a law and economics professor who taught me torts and corporations. He's been on this podcast before, and he opened my eyes to the extent to which this was an issue area that I should feel impacted my life and was about me and not just some guys in a bank somewhere. Um, And so I always love to invite people on to try to make what I have always found to be a somewhat um, inscrutable issue area more scrutable. So I appreciate your spending your time with me and us here today. Thanks. Yeah, no problem. Glad to be here. I'm a big fan. I Oh, thank you. I appreciate (laughs) that. Um, I wondered wondered if we could first start um, by talking about a subject that has kind of gone off the political radar, despite being a pretty hot topic at an earlier part, time in this electoral cycle, which is the question of inflation, who's at fault, whether or not Joe Biden is sufficiently to blame, and what role various narratives that have been put forward um, in the context of the 2024 cycle, including the corporate greed argument, are accurate Um, sources of blame for the phenomenon itself. I had an episode um, with Professor Fidel Kaboob um, some months ago where he was talking about four um, areas that really drove inflation specifically, if I recall correctly, um, uh, healthcare costs, transportation costs, housing costs, and food costs, um, and how the fact of inflation rising in those areas um, created a counter narrative to let's say the Biden administration's desire to say, well, look, the prices in this uh, area or overall inflation is on the decline and I should get credit for that. And I wondered what you make of the status of that particular argument as it's being wielded by different political factions right now. Yeah, I mean, I think the most important thing to recognize about debates around inflation is that maintaining low inflation is absolutely a central cornerstone of globalization. And that's because the most important thing to that that has to be maintained as a as a as a precondition for globalization to to be successful is class discipline. So any sign that inflation is ticking up will automatically make the central bank, the Federal Reserve, quite nervous because they'll fear that even if wages aren't pushing up inflation, which was the case during the 1970s crisis when workers wage militancy was, you know, leading the push toward inflation, leading corporations to raise prices uh, in order to recuperate profits in the context of rising labor costs. Um, Any sign whatsoever that inflation is starting to tick up makes them nervous because the possible outcome could be that workers start demanding more. And if workers start demanding more at the workplace through strike action or whatever, uh, the that can get out of control very quickly and lead to a problem that is very difficult to solve. Um, so the, the central bank, you know, tends to interpret any sign of inflation as inadequate class discipline and therefore to resort to raising interest rates and therefore raising unemployment, slowing down the economy and raising unemployment uh, as a way of holding down wages and restraining workers' demands as the key lever of controlling inflation. So that's really the kind of class context in which the inflation conflict is emerging. Now, in terms of what inflation signifies, I think primarily it has a lot to still do with the imbalances in the in the economy and supply chains, et cetera, coming out of COVID. Um, and, you know, there's, there's never been a time in the history of capitalism in which we just forcibly, by decree, shut down the entire economy. Like, that's a new thing. And, you know, it caused all kinds of imbalances in terms of supply chains and so on that are globalized. And so supply and demand for things like shipping are yo-yoing all over the place. Um, and, and that has caused a lot of disruption in, in, in globalized supply chains. So I think people be, between, between uh, uh, the issues with supply chains, w- between the issues with people having some excess savings after, after coming out of COVID with the stimulus payments, and se- et cetera, and, and, uh, and these kind of temporary imbalances, inflation we're seeing is, is, a kind of, is a probably most likely a relatively passing phenomenon. Uh, whether it's under control now or not, I mean, you could read the tea leaves either way. It seems to me like it probably is coming down. 
Um, but I think, you know, obviously the right will seize on any sign of inflation as signs that workers need more discipline. And the progressive left has has seized on inflation and uh, uh, pointing to it as a, as a sign that corporations are excessively greedy and we need, you know, higher corporate taxes and, and, and a more autonomous state, which, you know, would be good. But whether or not that's actually the cause of it or not, I, I would say it's probably a more systemic, deeper rooted issue than just corporations kind of greedily raising prices. I mean, there does seem to be kind of unanimity on the the far left, the, I would say the, the real left, as opposed to the left, as it's often described by, um, you know, the center and kind of uh, right, independent, um, Trump inclined, um, kind of anti-establishment, let's say, uh, people on the right that are very skeptical of any accounting of inflation that says things are getting better. And it's being framed by both of those factions as evidence that the establishment is deeply out of touch, that real world experience is that things are getting much more difficult. Um, Stats about the average price of a home in the 1980s as compared to the average salary versus now are circulated as evidence of that. And that all seems legitimate and true. And in some ways, it does seem like whatever um, inflation statistic that the Biden administration wants to tweet out every now and again to show that it's being brought under control is completely beside the point, because it doesn't seem like what folks are complaining about is whatever the uh, inflation metric is per se, but a more systemic and um, longstanding problem with cost of living simply not keeping a pace with wage growth. Yeah. Yeah. So for, I mean, for the past four decades, you know, wages in the United States have either stagnated or declined. And in the context of, you know, the current inflationary dynamic, you know, basically, yeah, even if inflation is tapering off now, depending on how you look at it, for the reasons you're pointing to correctly, uh, you know, real wages have taken a hit. That's been the major consequence of that. So it's all well and good to say people should be happy because look, inflation numbers are, 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 are slowing in terms of the rate of growth of inflation. But if 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 you're, what you're actually saying is you you took your real wage cut now be happy because it's not getting cut further, you know <laughs> it's not a surprise that working people don't exactly find that satisfactory, and and it definitely signals the need for a much broader based uh, economic transformation than what Biden has even begun to contemplate. So where is the money going? Because I, I do have sympathy for, and maybe you can disabuse me of the sympathy for some of these corporate greed arguments, especially when there's various lawsuits or antitrust actions that find that there is price gouging in the egg industry or what have you, where the reality of the supply chain crisis during COVID caused various industries to exploit um, basically the expectation that prices were going to be higher and genuinely gouge people. Um, on the at the By the same token, there is this argument on the left that says, well, hey, look, productivity is up. Um, it's not that Americans are working any less hard. The money is existing. These companies are boasting record profits. So where is it going? What's the kind of narrative that you would tell, if not the kind of greedflation narrative, as to where all of the profits, which are in existence, are going, if not they're if not being returned to the American workforce? Yeah. So I mean, definitely you're you're right on the money in terms of profit rates uh, being at historic highs. And so these corporations that are raising prices in the current moment are definitely, you know, padding profits with that. But one has to recognize the, the, the broader structural context in which this is occurring, in which supply chain issues, et cetera, aren't just made up, in which, you know, market uh, disruptions by, that were caused by COVID were very real. And so corporations are both kind of raising prices because they can and because they have to, right? They're taking advantage of of a situation, but but also that situation was caused by an unprecedented disruption uh, to their ability to operate their global supply chains in a normal fashion, um, and therefore created the opportunity, including shortages, to raise to raise prices beyond what would be considered normal. So really, what we're looking at is the is the is the 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 basic inability of a market based economic system to manage the kinds of disruptions and crises that we're going to have to expect to occur on a much wider scale, a much more frequent scale, much more frequent basis as the climate change crisis, the ecological crisis continues to intensify. Um, and, and the idea that markets can, can uh, serve as a mechanism for, for addressing 
the disruptions that are going to occur, of which this is perhaps just the first uh, of the current period, uh, is, is clearly inadequate. And I think this is just further evidence of that. So what does Marx have to say about this? Because my my what I was struck by when I was listening to your um, conversation on, I guess, what might be described as an MMT podcast, um, it re- took me back to a world where in the kind of post Bernie 2016 era, it felt like the left was putting forward a lot more kind of a prescriptive agenda for how we thought the world should be run, how our economic economic system should be restructured more broadly, as opposed to the place we're in now, which feels very reactive. Um, perhaps because we feel so much more disempowered than we did after, you know, Bernie took a pretty strong swing in 2016 and then maybe a less strong, but still very present um, swing in, in 2020. And I sometimes find myself frustrated and even resentful that we are having, we're, we're playing on a, a kind of a neoliberal playing field again. I, 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 I hear leftists articulating concerns about, for example, immigration because of the consequences to the lowest tranche of the American workforce, which I think are real and legitimate to be concerned about, but which kind of derail any kind of a humanistic conversation about why we're in this position in the first place, why, more importantly, immigrants who are fleeing all kinds of horrible conditions are in this position in the first place and taking instead a very defensive posture. And so trying to get us out of that defensiveness, which I think has in some ways undermine our kind of progressive ideals, if I can put it that way. I wonder if I could pick your brain about what kind of economic prescriptions you would put forward for the current political moment, given that we're in this, this, we're in a campaign season with two historically unpopular people who seem to be battling about who is more unpopular and distasteful and anti-democratic as opposed to what their actual policy agenda is. Yeah. I mean, I think the first the first uh, and most important thing to say in regard to your question is that we have to find a way of getting out of this continued cycle where every four years, number one, all the oxygen gets sucked out of all political activity and political commentary that doesn't directly relate to which party is is, is the least bad. Um, yeah. So we, we have to find a way of getting out of that. And we have to find a, a, a way out of the dynamic whereby each each four years we're, we're faced with a choice between the least worst of the two candidates. And so I think left strategy has to be oriented around finding a way out of that. And that requires building an alternative. Um, and that requires, in turn, you know, building a political organization that, it, that has a, a very significant you know, uh, mass following on the part of the working class in, in the United States, um, eventually the majority of the working class. Now, obviously, that's a very tall order. Uh, but unfortunately, there is just no shortcut around that. I mean, in terms of in terms of the specific reforms that I think should be considered on should be placed on the agenda. I mean, the first and most important, and most immediate is is breaking with globalization. Um, the global the globalization is a form of class war, and it's effectively a mechanism for reducing labor costs, disciplining workers, putting them in comp- putting workers all around the world and states all around the world for jobs and for investment. And, and therefore uh, continuously lowering expectations about, about what's possible. So the first and most important thing is to find a way to break with globalization. And that could be done through implementing what are called capital controls, which basically are controls limiting the ability for capital to move uh, across borders, right? Limiting capital's ability to move freely, but imposing costs on capital's ability to move freely. But that then raises the question of what to do with the investment that stays at home. So if you're telling corporations that they can't just move abroad easily and cheaply, freely, basically in the current context, what is done with the investment that stays here? Well, that should also be up to the public, right? That should also be a matter of democratic decision and not simply a uh, based on profit maximization. So then that opens the door for us to say, well, the public should have a say over whether we invest in fossil fuels or solar panels, or whether we invest in infrastructure or bombs. Um, you know, I think that that all of those decisions should be up to the public. And, and so just capital controls are a start, but they're not the end. Um, ultimately, I think we have to be moving toward a situation in which we can we, the economy is fundamentally restructured uh, so that instead of serving private profits, it serves social and ecological need. And the truth is that some kind of planning of the kind that I'm describing is absolutely essential for dealing with the climate crisis. And basically, almost everybody who's serious recognizes that. The question is, what kind of planning we're going to have? 
Is it going to be a democratic form of planning that is responsive to the needs of, of working people? Or is it going to be planning that is mostly designed to increase the profits of multinational corporations and to hand them valuable intellectual property on it that they can then sell internationally on a competitive basis? You know, I think, I think so the question then becomes, how, where are the forces going to come from that can compel this economic planning to be democratic, right? Where are the forces going to come from that can serve as the basis to advocate and push for the kinds of, of economic uh, structures that we're going to need in order to, to face a, a pretty scary future. And I think that requires us to build the work, build, build working class power. I want to come back to that, but I am really curious about the logistics of capital control. It evokes some of the, for lack of a better word, America first policies that Donald Trump ran on in 2016 that seemed to be frankly very popular with people precisely because they saw how globalization shut down their factories in the 90s. And there was all of this debate around NAFTA and Hillary Clinton's and the Clinton's fingerprints on that. And that did seem to give Trump an edge in 2016 that I think was broadly ignored by the mainstream media that was focused more on his unsavory comments about various uh, historically marginalized groups, immigrants and the like, as opposed to this kind of economic pitch that he was making that frankly even appealed to some people who were targets of his identity-based ire. You know, logistically speaking, how feasible is it to restrict the flow of dollars across borders and to limit the ability of companies to send jobs overseas and to take advantage of cheaper markets across the world. Um, what would that look like and what kind of pushback would you expect from a candidate that took seriously this question of combating globalization? Yeah, that's 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 the million dollar question, Brianna. That's an excellent and really important way of putting the problem. I mean, basically, technically, like economically, capital controls are completely feasible. There's nothing at all difficult about imagining implementing capital controls. The question and the difficulty is all political because the corp, you know, multinational corporations in the financial sector are both profiting hand over fist from the current form of globalization. And the last thing that they want to do is, is see that rolled back, right? In which case they would face you know, potentially higher labor costs, potentially have to make concessions to American workers, uh, in the since they can't simply relocate investment where you know things are easier for them, things are cheaper for them. So they would fight back immensely. and and this requires taking on in a very direct and radical way uh, capital, right? And, and it's certainly in a much grander scale than than Joe Biden has has considered. and even people like Bernie Sanders. I was a huge supporter of Sanders in 2016 and 2020. Uh, but Bernie did not mention capital controls, right? He did not go so far as to really fundamentally question, the structure of globalization. Now, of course, that's strategic in part, right? I mean, um, Bernie Sanders is trying to win an election. And so that imposes constraints, you know, regardless of what he believes truly in his heart, that, that imposes some very real constraints. Um, but I think it, in order to get something like that done would require much more than winning a presidential election, right? So you have one guy in the White House uh, saying he wants capital controls. What happens when, you know, the big banks and every multinational corporation and both political parties come out against him or her? You know, it's not going to go very well. So we need to build a, a, a deeply rooted working class political force that is capable of mass mobilization, that is capable of real disruption, that is capable of forcing the issue to put something like a break with globalization on the agenda. And this is really the situation we are now in, which is that there is a real polarization of options. Throughout the entire 20th century, most of the mainstream left, the so-called social democratic left, effectively pursued a class compromise strategy with capital, where they said, okay, there's a segment of the capitalist class that is open to compromise with us, that is open to, to, to allow the working class some increased standards of living within capitalism, some reforms uh, to, to industry and trade, et cetera, some, some expansionary kind of social programs. And so we'll, we'll form an alliance with that part of capital in, in order to win reforms in the short term for the working class within capitalism. Today, there is no such partner for such an alliance. The industrial sector is completely tied up and benefiting from globalization. So is the financial sector. So there's, an, there's an argument out there, which my co-author Scott, Scott Aquano and I take on in our recent book, uh, The Fall and Rise of American Finance. There's this argument out there that workers can just team up, form an alliance with industrial capitalists, the good old manufacturing capitalists, against the real exploiters who are the financiers. And so what we have to do then is team up with industrial capital to rein in a parasitic financial sector. 
But the truth is that the industrial capitalists are just as are benefiting just as much or profiting just as much from globalization as the financiers are. So you're, you're in a situation where there's a polarization of options. The working class is, is, is as weak as it's ever been. And at the same time, the scale of the conflict, the, the confrontation with capital necessary in order to even bring about moderate reforms is going to have to be very intense. So we have to really go about organizing in a deep way. And there's just no shortcut around doing that. Yeah, I, I hear that argument, but I also am frustrated by what it seems it's like a chicken and egg question. Yes, um, I, I you know I, I hear you saying you need to do deep organizing. I heard you say uh, on the other podcast, as I've heard many folks who've come through this podcast store, that we are experiencing, uh, despite I understand the more recent gains in the last a year or two, but uh, historical low um, kind of uh, labor concentration that um, the union movement is historically weak. Um, that. You know, it, and therefore, we're just going to have to organize for a long time and very deeply before we can mobilize on some of this stuff. At the same time, I I hear you talk about the kind of ideas that, frankly, I think could have a significant mobilizing effect, like taking Trump's, you know, America firstism and saying, oh, actually, let me wind up, one up you. We're going to talk about taking globalization head on. I mean, the glo- talking about globalist is like a weird right wing, vaguely anti-Semitic, you know, dog whistle when perhaps it really should be a populist left rallying cry for not just a kind of right wing protectionism, but a genuine investment in an American workforce. But how do you get that message out when even people, to your point, like Bernie Sanders, aren't speaking in those kinds of terms? And when I heard you talking on the other podcast about how um uh, the the COVID moment and um, the temporary reforms were kind of evidence of a sort of a managed capitalism, that uh, capitalism was tested in the context of COVID. Um, and it basically, I, I'm putting this poorly, please do correct me, but the, the kinds of temporary programs that we got weren't some benevolence from on high. They were a Band-Aid put on a crack in, in, in the dike that is capitalism. And what I would have liked to have seen in that moment when cap- the limits of capitalism, the vulnerabilities of capitalism were exposed, or people like Bernie Sanders or the members of the squad coming forward and pointing to neoliberals and saying, look, they, they're acting like they're giving you something, but they're just perpetuating the status quo. And as evidence, look at the fact of, look at the, the fact that these programs are temporary in nature, that they've designed them to expire. Let me tell you instead what our plan should be and how we should take advantage of these kinds of opportunities to build power for the working class. This is exactly why you should be behind us. And so I guess my question is, how can one expect to grow that movement, to capture the interests of a broad working class movement, the likes of which Bernie wasn't able to manage, and the likes of which no socialist movement has really managed to put together, um, if if you don't have someone leading the charge on foregrounding these ideas in really public and um, fearless way, so fearless, like not caring about whatever kind of rebuke is going to come from, of course, the folks that are going to say you're a socialist and you're crazy and you're bad and you're wrong and you should get out of the Democratic Party. Well, I, yeah, that's another excellent question. Um, so, I mean, I think the, the 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 primary difference between what I would regard as a kind of social democratic politics and a socialist politics is not about how radical of a position that you take. It's not about saying, oh, you know, those mainstream center left people, they want $15 an hour minimum wage, so we want $16.50. Oh, they want $16.50, we want $17. You know, it's not about simply taking a more radical position. The, the most important difference is over the way you do politics. That is to say that socialist politics is about class formation. It's about organizing and forming the working class into a coherent po- social and political force capable of acting to change the world. And that means bringing ordinary people into the political, into politics in a new way, cultivating and developing their democratic capacities to take control of their lives, to act in ways that, that, that tr- tr- change themselves and change the world. And I think without, without something like that happening, it's hard to imagine the, the kinds of, of changes that we're both describing happening. I mean, 
the COVID, the COVID uh, crisis and, and the, the, the orientation toward distributing vaccines and so on that you're mentioning is a really good example of this. Like, it's hard to imagine a better example of the inadequacies of the for-profit model of pharmaceutical development and distribution than COVID, right? And, the, and it's so inadequate to deal with the social problem of, of, of the pandemic that they actually had to temporarily suspend the normal way in which pharmaceutical products are distributed and give them to people for free because it's a problem that that can't simply be solved by saying whoever can afford vaccines go buy them good luck you know it, it required actually that everybody be vaccinated and so the government had to provide vaccines to people for free right and that is absolutely as you're saying a missed opportunity for the left to say look the whole for-profit model of pharmaceutical uh, development and distribution is ludicrous and totally ill-equipped to deal with the age of pandemics that is upon us with the ecological crisis. It's not going to get better unless, you know, very radical shifts in our energy system and so on are, are, are undertaken. But it, at least in the very short term, it's not going to get better. So we're going to need a different model, right? The model that we have, this capitalist for-profit model, is simply not able to deal with the problem. So I think what we have to be doing here is is class formation. That that means that means showing people that capitalism is 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 unable to to meet human and ecological needs, and it means developing people's capacities to change it and to bring about something else. And I think that that is the that is the, the primary way in which the comparison between you know the Tea Party right or the or the MAGA right and the and the progressive Bernie Krat left really doesn't work, right? Because the, the MAGA right is not about developing the capacities of the working class. They're about electing charismatic figures to, to take control and, and hopefully uh, implement their interests once they're in office, which obviously they won't because they're completely in bed with corporate capitalism. Yeah, it's interesting. Their focus seems to be, I think that they could make an argument. They would make an argument that says something like, it is enriching the power of the people to... Uh, free them from the yoke of various as institutions that they perceive to be um, oppressive. So whereas we root our um, immiseration in the power of capital and corporations and their ability to lobby Congress to advance interests that are not our own, et cetera, um, they would root it in to some degree, um, the deep state um, spying limitations on speech, uh, DEI programs that they perceive to be limiting their professional uh, upward mobility, uh, immigrants who they perceive to be substantially limiting their um, uh, upward mobility, and therefore to be free of those things is to have more democracy and to solve the problems of the world. And we have different diagnoses there, but I, I do think that they, they're they being sold a sort of, they have, I, what, I'm, what I'm interested in is this way that um, certain right figures have tapped into a shared perception that the system is rigged, a shared perception that the economy is working for the few and not the many, as evidenced by Trump's inveighing against NAFTA and the like. Um a weird defensiveness of programs like Social Security that is separate and apart from what historically the Republican establishment has wanted, and in some moments, the Democratic establishment as well has wanted. But how the right has managed to subvert all of that kind of energy into being mad at DEI programs, being mad at the vac you know, the vaccine for different reasons. People feel like they were lied to and misrep misrep it was misrepresented the need for vaccines in certain contexts instead of having a critique of what it means for our healthcare system to be exposed in the way that it was, what it means for um, uh, so many people to be unemployed because of COVID and to realize that your ability to be treated for a pandemic was contingent on you having a job. And so I, I, I'm drawing those parallels not because I have any interest in validating the right, but because I see at least a cynical ability of their politicians to tap into, I think, genuine observations about the brokenness of the system in a way that, forget the Democratic Party, I don't have very much hope for them, but even left elected seem to have shied away from in the COVID moment and since then. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, so the... What you're picking up on is something that's incredibly significant, which has been present in basically every context 
since the 20th century in which the far right has been on the ascent. Basically, the way the far right operates is they recognize the contradiction in capitalism, the class contradiction. They recognize it. They, they, they speak to the, the subaltern uh, experience, right? The experience of dispossession, of marginalization, of, of feeling uh, dis, dispossessed, right? But what they say is, oh, it's not capital that's, that's doing this. It's the Jews. It's, it's, it's the immigrants, right? And, and so they project the cause of, of all the suffering that is very real, which they're acknowledging, onto this other. And that, that usually takes the form of some shadowy cabal that's it's inside the state and outside the state, you know, the cultural Marxists. I mean, I wish the cultural Marxists had as much power as Donald Trump and his supporters <laughs> say that they did. I mean, really, I mean, you know, I, so, you know, I, I think, you know, they, 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 this is a very common thing. And, and it's incredibly dangerous because it, 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 it finds fertile ground in contexts like ours where there is extreme social inequality, where there is incredible anxiety about the future, and in which there is a sense deeply felt of profound, anxi a profound anxiety about the future. And I think the, the, uh, the, it's the, the ability of the far right in the current moment to, to narrate people's anxieties, to connect with their anger, especially white people who feel that the country that is being taken away from them and that, and that the, the, the stagnating wages and rising precarity that has afflicted the entire working class over the past four decades is somehow a function of, the, of a, an evil welfare state that is distributing income and resources away from the deserving white people and toward undeserving minorities and immigrants, etc type of stuff you see Elon Musk talking about every single day on Twitter, um, that, that that's really the problem. And so that what has to be defeated in order to bring about social justice from that perspective is, is the left, right? Because they're the ones who are, who are in an unfair way through a welfare state that is inefficient and unfair and corrupt, distributing resources toward undeserving minorities and away from deserving whites. That's what's crazy. As you're talking right now, I honestly, I'm I'm racking my brain. I don't even hear people talking about welfare and kind of the undeserving black and brown in that sort of a context anymore. I hear tons of immigrant stuff, which, by the way, it's worth noting is attracting a historically unprecedented number of blacks and Latinos to the Republican Party and to Trump specifically, regardless of what he may or may not have said at some point about Mexico not sending their best, et cetera, and building a wall. That is not a barrier for reasons that I think need more exploration, voters don't see some of those remarks as being about them. You know, some of them don't need an explanation. If you're an American Latino, then it's quite literally not about you because you're not an immigrant. You are probably not even Mexican. And, and so it has nothing to do with you. And I do think the media has collapsed all those things together and presumed that equal, everyone was going to be equally offended by it. Um, if you have like a drop of melanin in your skin and that just hasn't been how it's panned out. But also to my going back to my initial point, I don't even feel like those ta attacks against like welfare queens, et cetera, are really the core of the Republican um, approach now. Now it's weirdly lifted up off the bottom tier of American um, uh, society from a class perspective and attacking the poor black and brown. And it's gone right up to the the this weird kind of uh, white collar environment and attacks on DEI and the deservedness of middle class blacks in a hiring environment. And the, the the focus seems to be almost riling up the black the, the the white middle class who perhaps were a little bit less likely to buy into um because of college education being a marker for um more progressive attitudes toward race and integration. Maybe they are less likely to buy into a um you know more reductive more explicitly racist rhetoric, but might find more sympathy in a, oh my gosh, I didn't get this job in a white collar environment because this job posting said they were looking for hearing impaired or black or, uh, you know, formerly incarcerated or whatever it is, people that doesn't include me, which is, it's, it's again, fascinating to see the right pivoting and shifting and trying new messaging when the left had COVID and didn't even bother to say, hey, gee willikers, maybe we should have a hearing about why we've set up our system to only give you health care if you have a job when we're in the middle of a mass unemployment crisis. Yeah, I mean, there's so much to say about this. You're raising so many important issues. I mean, the, the thing you're saying about the point you're making about DEI 
is, is, is continuous with the narrative about the welfare state. So there, there's been interesting research about Trump supporters and how it is that so many of them actually rely on the very social programs that are ostensibly going to be placed under attack if he were to win, right? And if Republicans in general win. Um, and, and very often those people just assume that, oh, well, this doesn't apply to me. They're only talking about those undeserving folks. So I, even though I rely on these social programs, I'll be able to retain my access to them because this guy who I'm going to vote for, he, he'll look out for the right people and make sure that we're protected. It's all about those other people. And it's the same thing with the DEI stuff you're talking about, right? This, that was supposed to be my position, right? I'm entitled to that. And instead, this, this faux black middle class has been created, but you know, minority middle class has been created because they're just handed everything, right? And so the whole state is set up because of this woke, whatever, whatever. This whole state is now set up to basically promote in an undeserved way, you know, people of color and therefore disenfranchise and dispossess white people. So the whole, all of politics becomes framed as like a racial struggle. Right. And, and it's, it's framed as a racial struggle over over state power. And so the, the main way you win that is by is by making sure that your guy wins and he looks out for the right people. Right. The deserving people. Um, the, in terms of the, the point you, 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 you keep coming back to about about covid and the lost opportunity for the Bernie crowd left in Congress and so on. I think this is a really important point, but I think. I think we have to be careful not to simply fall into the narrative of, oh, AOC, Ilan Omar, you know, they're just traitors, right? They just betrayed us all. I mean, sure, maybe there's some truth to that in certain moments. Maybe they could be more radical. Maybe they could have stood up and fought a little more on this or that issue. But I think more important for a serious analysis of, of the current political moment is to understand that we have to expect this is going to happen, right? If you just elect people into Congress, there's, there's overwhelming tendencies for those people to be simply co-opted into a kind of very narrow parliamentarist sense of politics, right? To, to forget about the forms of extra parliamentary mobilization, movement building, et cetera, that, that they actually probably bene possibly benefited from. And certainly we would hope over the long run, they'd be committed to building. So, so as a left, we have to expect that to happen and build the forces needed to counteract it, right? To counteract the co-optation of these people. Yes, but Steve, we're, we're in this chicken and the egg situation again. So let, let's bring this to, you were talking about, again, on that other, on the Macaroni and Cheese podcast, about how you need two things. You need a working class movement and you need a working class political party, separate and apart from the Democratic Party. And I see these things as related when we're talking about how to characterize the behavior of the squad. No, I don't think it's that they're sitting there like Machiavelli rubbing their fingertips together, plotting, ah, ha, ha, I tricked all these leftists to get me in and now I'm going to get my book deal. No. Maybe and I cases. And I do think you, <laughs> maybe, maybe in some cases, but, and I, and I don't, you know, I don't, I, I completely take your point that whether it's Bernie or the squad members, you have to have an expectation about what the limits of the system that you're participating in really are. But I also saw these people, some of them at least, people like AOCs, presented themselves as folks that understood those kind of restrictions and the barriers they were going to encounter and be working at, from their positions of authority within Congress to help build the working class movement that would be adversarial to Congress at the same time. And what we've seen when Bernie ended his campaign in the 2016 and 2020 cycle and did not choose to, to roll it into a movement effort and be oppositional to the Democratic Party and leave open the possibility of not voting for the Democratic candidate and endorsing third party candidates, that at, at every turn, the people who I that should, and I think in a, frankly, in a right wing context, would be funneling that energy into adversarial politics, do the exact opposite. And then you see leftists in the media sphere one might describe it as running cover for or providing a defense of the squad and their disappointing actions, further insulating them from any consequences from their ostensible base. And you see, again, even members of the left media sphere saying bizarrely dismissive comments about third party efforts, whether it's the Green Party. Oh, we don't like the Green Party because they never get anything done, even though I personally have never tried to help them improve. Um, but while still complaining about the lack of a third party alternative or even moments like uh, the movement for a People's Party, which obviously due to, you know, personal bad acts by people involved, crashed, uh, crumbled for those kinds of reasons. But long before any of that came to light, I think presented some real possibilities and saw a lot of naysayers even from the jump. So, I, you know, I, I hear people saying, yes, we need a movement. We need all these things. But I'm also seeing a real neglect 
of the other half of that, which I think would it would enable the first, which is being able to have a receptacle to put all the energy um, that is generated from these political cycles into a place that is distinctly not the Democratic Party, that is much more difficult to co-opt in the way that we've seen the Bernie and Squad movement energy get co-opted. Absolutely, without a doubt, you're right. I mean, like, there is no question that the Democratic Party is not the vehicle we need to improve the lives of working people and to deal with the immense, historic, unprecedented challenges that we're as a species facing, right, in terms of the ecological breakdown that's happening all around us. So the Democratic Party is definitely not the vehicle that we need. And any idea that the Democratic Party is going to be transformed are just absolutely utopian pipe dreams. There is absolutely no doubt about that. There couldn't be any clearer lesson of the past, you know, century of American politics than that. Um, but the, the point also has to be made, I think, that that even in the event that, you know, you and I get what we want, which is to say we have a socialist party that's somehow viable and even electorally viable, which we're quite a ways away from. Once you elect that party to power, there's still going to need to be extra parliamentary mobilizations and forces capable of sustaining the radical orientation of that party. And hopefully the members of that party would be committed to promoting the radicalization at the grassroots too. But we, all, we, all, we do know also based on history that the tendency is for those parties that get elected to office, even if they go in with radical intent, you know, as the social democratic parties in Europe initially did in the, throughout the 20th century, right? The tendency has been, including communist parties in Europe, right? To get, to get absorbed within the machinery of those states and to de-radicalize and demobilize and discipline the working class and to get sucked into a very narrow parliamentary perspective whereby electoral timetables, et cetera, become everything, whereby calibrating every message for electoral appeal becomes the overriding concern, right? Whereby making compromises and wheeling and dealing with others in parliament becomes a practical necessity, right? Unless you have an overwhelming force in the, in the legislative body, which, you know, doesn't tend to happen. Um, so, so we need to all, so the, you're right, it's a chicken and the egg, but I think the, the kind of politics we need is one that brings together in a, in a creative and, and, and historically novel way, extra parliamentary mobilization and parliamentarism, right? I'm not somebody who says screw electoralism. It doesn't mean anything. Obviously that's silly. We do need to, to, to contest power on the terrain of the state. There's no question, but, but we also need to be able to build mass mobilizations on the street. And if we simply put everything into the idea that elections and electing people who are good is everything, the, the result is going to be that, you know, the predictable outcome will occur, which is that those people will evolve in ways that we've seen happen with, say, so in the US, you know, in, in the UK, we had Corbyn and, and, and Sanders in 2016, right? In, in, in Greece, Spain, and Portugal, they, where they have proportional representation, new parties were formed, Syriza, Blocos and, Blocco, and Podemos. And what happened to those parties, right? They basically got deflected, marginalized. They formed coalitions with the, the, the traditional social democratic parties and their radical potential was blunted. So just forming a new party in itself isn't enough. Yeah. We need a different theory of politics. I mean, that's partly why I, I hate to keep coming back to this. Like, I promise you, I am not secretly uh, a fan of Marjorie Taylor Greene or any of these characters. <laughs> you don't have but to look, I'm, I'm watching... <laughs> Despite what I've been accused of on the internet, but I'm I'm watching what's happening right now, right? Where Marjorie Taylor Greene isn't happy with uh, new speaker Mike Johnson um, passing this uh, uh, funding bill, and is threatening to uh, bring a motion to vacate to the floor. She's filed it, but she hasn't um, uh, brought it to a vote yet. Uh, to eject Mike Johnson the same way they did Speaker McCarthy in that historic, what, 15 round rounds of voting. Now, what is driving her, what she wants, whether or not I believe in her political ideals, that's not the point. And obviously I don't. But when you when you talk about the preciousness around uh, procedural timetables as being the priority in these in, in, in these systems, and I see her willing to blow it all up in this kind of, um, I mean, she's not in the Freedom Caucus anymore, but Freedom Caucus adjacent um, caucus of folks who really are willing to put it all on the line and frankly are not in large part suffering any consequences for it back in their districts, but instead are being seen as fighters for going up against the, the Republican establishment, as it were. It does make me feel frankly less sympathetic to the choices that are being made by so many left progressives in Congress. Not only are the right rabble rousers who are going against their parties um, 
continuing to be popular in their district, they have been, they've managed to successfully gum up the works with very small numbers. Meanwhile, our left leaders are telling us just go to the polls and keep voting for Democrats and maybe someday, you know, when, you know, I'm old and gray or my grandchildren are old and gray, <laughs> you can hope to have, uh, you know, a, a filibuster proof majority to pass a $15 minimum wage yeah. back at a point at which that'll be worth uh, $2. Yeah, no, exactly. Yeah, exactly. I mean, the, the idea is, I think the critical point to make here is that we, we have to find a way, if we all agree that, you know, the Democratic Party isn't the answer, we have to find a way to get from here to there, right? Is what the squad, et cetera, is doing right now leading toward a break with the Democratic Party, leading towards some kind of viable situation in which we no longer are forced to, to do harm reduction every four years, but we actually have the opportunity to, to change the world in ways that we want it to be changed. And the answer is that they're not. What they're basically forming is a, is a left kind of progressive caucus within the Democratic Party. And that's kind of been apparent for some time now. Now, that doesn't mean that, yeah. those, that, that, doesn't mean that real victories you know, and some positive benefits can't come from that. Right. But but it does mean that that there's no clear road from from what they're doing now to a future in which we're not continuously saying just hope Democrats win and, and at least it won't be as bad. And we have a couple left people here and there in the Congress. Right. Who can who can hopefully get this or that item on the agenda in a way that helps working people. Also, to your point about the need to expose these class contradictions and create a working class movement. The, the, the reason I believe this is so pernicious, I'm just I'm trying to synthesize this as we're talking and why I keep coming back to the COVID moment is because I think those are moments to expose the contradictions that are inherent within the Republican Party and both the Democratic and, Repub and Republican establishment and the presence of squad members in Congress increasingly feels to me like providing affirmation for um, validation of the system in the same way that hiring minorities to work at Raytheon and to be in Congress and Linda Thomas Greenfield with, raises her black hand to veto, you know, uh, ceasefire agreements again and again, not today, but multiple times in the past is a way to pretend a system which still systemically disadvantages people from those groups that are represented yeah. to look like it's fair and just and equitable. Right. And now we're having like a political version of that sort of identity politics by having the left represented in Congress, despite them not behaving in ways that we one would expect the, the left to behave. If you are doing... Um, rotating villain so that someone takes the hard vote, whether it's on funding the police or um, sending more aid to Israel or whatever it is. If you have, um, you know, uh, people like Pramila Jayapal coming out every quarter saying, well, uh, Biden or even AOC, Biden is the best po uh, politician of my lifetime. Instead of using that airtime on MSNBC to discuss all of the ways in which he could have done better to, to, explain how we could have actually had the student debt cancellation if he hadn't tried to means test it, then how can you get away without, you know, how how isn't it unfair to say that you're a fraud squad or a sellout or any of these other kind of um, accusations that they've been charged with? Yeah, I mean, so for me, I, I think the, the the point you're making is is well taken, but but I think and, and I think it's true that, you know, the extent to which they have just fallen into lockstep behind Biden on every issue is, you know, craven in many respects. But I also think, I guess the point I'm trying to make is that I think it doesn't go far enough in terms of the task that we have to fulfill as a left to just point the finger at them and say they should do more. Yes, maybe they should do no, more. No, I hear that. It's not, it's not all their fault. But, th but this is your, to your point. How do you generate class consciousness? I mean, I'm not saying it's, you know, it's only AOC that can do it, but it, it, it does feel like an enormous missed opportunity yes. when we have this enormous project ahead of us. Yes, I think, I think that, that the problem is not, you know, the problem is more along the lines of how do we how do we think through a politics? What would a politics look like whereby, you know, AOC, the squad is 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 consciously and deliberately cultivating gra forces at the grassroots in support of a more yes. radical in support of a different politics oriented toward fundamentally transforming the unions. Right. For example, during the conflict over the Build Back Better bill, where were the unions on that? Right. And why weren't they being called out for, for playing a pretty negative role in terms of what the build, build Back Better bill ended up looking like? Right. Why? Why wasn't there any kind of any kind of uh, attempt to build a substantial base 
on the part of this very small and marginal grouping in Congress for, for some kind of different politics, right? Even if it's not, oh, we want to take over the means of production. You know, you don't expect that necessarily, right? But at least something, uh, some kind of different direction, right? An orientation toward, toward building forces at the base that can, that can develop a dynamic of radicalization over time and that can build in force and intensity and, and, and mobilizational capacity over time. There was no orientation to doing that. Right. And that is the failing. That's what I'm trying to get across. It's not it's not so much that, you know, she should be meaner to Nancy Pelosi or something, because, you know, if it's not Nancy Pelosi. Who's it going to be? It's that it's that there needs to be a different way of doing politics. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. And it, of course, it's not about being meaner to Nancy Pelosi. And it's not about saying a twenty dollar minimum wage instead of a 15 or now 22. And I'm edgier than you. I feel like the the fight over Nancy Pelosi for the speakership position is, is about your willingness to exercise power to fight for what you actually want because you have the leverage to demand it versus settling for some of these um, reformist policies. I am struck by the idea, you know, you, you kind of wave off, well, of course they wouldn't ask to, um, you know, own the means of production. But I think that, again, why I'm harping on this and specifically harping, harping on the successes that the right has had, at least rhetorically in this regard, is because to the extent that they are saying America first, there is an easy rejoinder to that from the left. But if you're not willing to take that, if you're not willing to meet uh, America first with, well, maybe workers should have ownership of their companies and they can decide whether or not they want to send these jobs overseas, then you're creating a void that empowers uh, a kind of um, kind of a nationalist, dare I say white nationalist, um, uh, populist movement on the right that has a lot of oxygen and a lot of strength and that frankly is poised to defeat Joe Biden in the fall. And that constructively is the fault of the left, not people like me who take the blame or Jill Stein who takes the blame, but the people who have real voices and powers and the ability to create a counter narrative that could really give the kind of MAGA movement a run for its money. Yeah, no, I totally agree. And I, I think they've abdicated their responsibility there. Yeah, go ahead. I'm sorry. What I was trying to say there was more, I don't expect AOC and the squad to say that stuff. I do think we need a left that's saying that stuff. And I think everything that you're saying points to the to the, the hard fact, which, which anybody would have to accept, that the left has basically ceded all the ground around the critique of globalization, the critique of of, of, of inequality, the critique of contemporary capitalism in a fundamental way uh, has ceded that ground to a, to a nationalist and growing right, right? And so there, there, we do need a left that that is willing to step into that void as you So call. who's it going to be? Who's it going to be? See, because here's the problem. For all of the critique that the podcast left gets, sometimes it does feel like we're standing here like holding the bag because no one else wants to, it's like a hot potato. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, you know, if it's not going to be SC in the squad, if it's God will, oh, please let it not have to be a bunch of podcasters, <laughs> then then who is left? Are we as a public intellectuals, the likes of what Cornel West and Chris Hedges, who don't get to go on TV, don't don't get any platforms? Are we are we hoping that Beyonce uh, finds Jesus <laughs> and realizes that she should be a socialist and takes over her Instagram and says, you know, Viva la Revolution. I mean, then we're going to be looking at an Instagram ban on top of a TikTok ban. <laughs> I mean, who who's it going to be? Well, I, I think I think we need a we need a genuine working class movement, and I think we need a new political organization. And I, I can't point to any national figure right now who I would say would lead that. But but I think I think that 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 you know, it's it's more more than who, it's what. And I think we need an, an or, a, a political organization that is grounded in the trade union movement. You know, Sean Fain, I think, has been doing a wonderful job. You know, not not that he's the leader we need to, to, to save us. But I think, you know, there, there's promising signs there that that, you know, things are that there's a willingness. I agree. But Steve, what do you make of the Biden endorsement? Well, I mean, I, I understand it, to be honest. I mean, I think I think that it's true that for all of Biden's, you know, many, many, many evils, I would prefer that he win to Donald Trump. And and that's not saying that Biden's so good. It's saying that the state we live in is so shitty, right? We live in, we have a state that calls itself a democracy, which is a sham democracy, right? It's, the, the forms of democracy that are permitted are extremely narrow. And the choice between Biden and Trump, to me, isn't so much a, a moral decision as a strategic question. Which one of these individuals is going to provide us with the most space to, 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 to organize, to mobilize, to do something different, to win some marginal victories here and there. You know, it's not, it's not going to be a huge difference, but there is a difference. And so insofar as there's a difference, you, you, you think about it for 10 seconds, you close your eyes, you hold your nose, you cast the vote, and then you go on with what you're doing. I think we should. But Steve, here's the question. 
prior to the endorsement, I don't think there was any ambiguity about the fact that Sean Fain was very critical of Donald Trump and thought he should not be president. He said, you know, uh, he made comments about how Donald Trump was not invited to whatever meetings and wasn't on whatever picket line and that he was misrepresenting his solidarity with the auto workers. There, without Sean Fain's endorsement, there's still a kind of anti-endorsement on the table of Donald Trump. So there's also a strategic question of whether or not the UAW workers or any other union workers are benefited from a world in which maybe do, uh, Joe Biden no longer has to solicit your opinions, to solicit your vote, has to earn your approval because there's already been some kind of a commitment made. Now, of course, people can vote how they want to vote regardless of how the um, union leadership endorses. But isn't that an, an equal uh, political consideration there? Strategic consideration. Yeah, I see what you're saying. And I, I think, yeah, I could I can understand that perspective. I mean, I, I think the the probably the endorsement came from the reality that, you know, there was a big risk that a lot of UAW members were going to vote for Trump. And and he was willing to make that endorsement on the basis of a deep fear that that they that Biden was not going to be able to make it. But why? Yeah. Why would some UAW vote workers vote for Trump? And why can't Biden make an argument as to why they shouldn't? absent this endorsement coming on, from on high. Yeah, because and if if there are people who that feel doing all that we know in the world that they want uh, Donald Trump over Joe Biden, is the fact that Sean Fain makes the endorsement that he made really going to change that person's mind? Well, maybe not. Is that yeah. is he taking out of out of Biden's wheelhouse or, or out of Biden's obligation? The obligation to make the argument as to why Trump's policies for your average auto worker are less good yeah. than what he would offer. It doesn't, it's stripped from Biden the obligation to make the case and to offer prescriptively actual programs, economic programs, social programs and the like that argue for why he's going to make people's lives better. Yeah. I mean, I don't think, I don't think one can expect, and I don't, I doubt Sean Fain expects that Joe Biden will be anything other than a corporate, excuse me, a corporate Democrat. I think Biden's a corporate Democrat. Biden's not about to say, let's fundamentally challenge globalization or any of the stuff we've been talking about here, right? And and really that's that's what's needed in order, let alone, you know, a significant right. yeah. That's what's needed. Yeah, let alone a significant <laughs> kind of uh project for a green transition, which is which is even more essential, right? Even more central to our uh survival as a species. So, you know, I don't think Sean Fain expects anything other than that. But I also think probably, and I'm not trying to defend him here, but I think I think also probably, you know, he believes, and he's right in my opinion, that Trump, that Biden would be less bad than Trump. And so the project of okay. rebuilding the power of the trade unions in this country, and and especially any kind of fighting unionism that goes beyond the, the narrow craven subservience to the Democratic Party that the union establishment has tended to uphold in recent decades, you know, is a long term project. And and if you have a if you have a, a a Trump presidency, it's going to be a major setback for organized labor, major. And and that has to, defeating that has to be step one, I think. And, and probably he knows that. Well, it's unlikely that, I mean, it's not looking good for Biden endorsement or not. But this is this is the fundamental point, I, I would say. If Sean Fain's not going to say we need to uh, address globalization and Joe Biden's not going to do it, if AOC is not going to say we need to address globalization and Joe Biden's not going to do it, what hope is there that anyone realizes that Joe Biden is not the droid you're looking for? He's not the <laughs> hero that you're looking for. Yeah. That there and that therefore you need to look to alternatives outside of the two party system and maybe pay attention to a third party and understand the benefits of said th third party as opposed to just being a punching bag for a democratic loss every four years. Yeah. Do you see how I'm do. saying these things are deeply entwined? Absolutely. And, and I think what you're pointing to is, is the very real dilemma and the crisis of the left, right? The left is in crisis right now, not just in the United States, all over the world. And it's been faced with defeat after defeat after defeat. Look, for the very first time since literally 1848, over the past de couple decades, we have, we lack any real systemic opposition to capitalism based in the working class, right? This is a new thing. And the left is in a deep and dire crisis. And what was so invigorating for some people about the Bernie uh, Sanders AOC squad moment was precisely that it appeared like that long series of defeats was about to be reversed and that there was basically a shortcut that would reinvigorate the left by offering it a realistic chance to power that, that would kind of get around the need to do all of the deep and long-term 
organizing that would be necessary to make even a Sanders presidency meaningful in any significant way. Like, so we, so say we get Bernie or AOC to say all this stuff that we want them to say, right? How are they going to be able to get that done? You know, if Bernie gets into the White House and he says, okay, I want capital controls, how, how in the world is he going to have the capacity to do that? There needs to be a massive, you know, mobilization, like a huge class struggle behind that in order to make that realistic. But that's, but Steve, that's the aspect of the chicken and the egg that I feel like I sometimes feel like people come on this show and it's almost like, I'm not saying they are <laughs> controlled opposition, but the argument constructively operates like controlled opposition. Because what I'm, what I'm saying is not that Bernie needs to get in and snap his fingers and magically we're living in a socialist utopia. What I'm saying is that there is a mutually reinforcing um, um, action at hand where because no one even tries, because Bernie doesn't say the thing, he never wins. Because AOC never says the thing, the movement doesn't exist. But and it's not just all on Bernie or AOC. I'm saying nobody says it. Yeah. You can't find a person yeah. in the world, not a news anchor, not a public ed intellectual. You're getting, people are getting canceled from their um, uh, academic context for being even remotely uh, Marxist. We're, you know, there's a war on these kind of ideas and there is no one in any quarter of our media pol political sphere who's willing to say simple things like you laid out in that very informative and interesting macro and cheese interview and, and in this one, like we need to address globalization. Like we need to have capital controls. Yeah, yeah, no, I And agree. how can you, like we're sitting here and you're saying, we need to have this movement based on what? What is the movement fighting for? They've never heard of capital controls in their life. Who's going to popularize capital control? Well, that's what you got to do. So it is do. on the podcasters. <laughs> that's what you got to do. No, exactly. That's what the left has to so do. So it is the podcast, the podcasters. This is what it comes back to. And people are like, the podcasters think they're leading, leading a movement and they're so annoying and blah, blah, blah. And Jimmy Dore and everyone's so mad. But it, I don't think it's an accident. No, I agree. I totally I don't think agree. It's an accident if everyone's looking at these podcasters because we're the only relatively independent I totally entities agree. that can, that can tap into resources like you and other academics and writers yep. and activists and movement leaders to say some true things. Yeah, ab absolutely. I think that's right. I think that's, you know, we, we need a left that is not there right now. Um, Adolf Reed, one of my favorite political thinkers, uh, great genius, you know, he says, he calls the left today, you know, the thing that occupies the cultural space that would be occupied by the left if there was a left, <laughs> right? And that's really what we have. We don't have a left. Yeah. And so we have to set about the task of building one. And, and I don't think we can just point to, you know, this or that individual and say that person is going to save us by, by taking a different line on something. I know you're not saying that. I think, I think we, have to, we have to say, we have to have an orientation toward politics of saying we have to rebuild. We have to build from essentially from scratch. And I think there's some promising indications in the DSA and everything, but that obviously faces its own problems and has a long way to go. Um, but I think we have to build the left. And, and that means, I think, also not, yeah. not necessarily thinking in terms of, you know, contesting the election in the next four years. I think the kind of left force, the kind of party political organization that we need, there's no realistic way you're going to say we're going to have what's needed in, in you know, four years from now. The question is, well, take do the we... four years off the yeah. table, though, Steve. The DSA, as I understand it, has explicitly said it is not a it's not going to run candidate. It's not a party. It's not going to make itself into a party regardless. Yeah. It's taken that off the table. So when I hear you say we need to have a mass movement and we need to have a party apparatus and then say the DSA seems to be hopeful, like a like a area of hopefulness for you. But the DSA themselves has said, I'm not going to participate directly in any of the party building activities. Yeah. Well, you know, they're, they're... Uh, to me, again, this is where it starts to get feel like almost controlled opposition because of how neatly everything feeds back into itself in a do nothing cycle. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I mean, I, I, I know there's a, there's, there's a conflict inside DSA over that question. Um, and, you know, I don't want to get too involved in internecine DSA you know, uh, <laughs> conflicts, but there, there is, you know, obviously different opinions on, on that. And I think what's promising is people's commitment recently, you know, in the wake of Sanders uh, defeat in 2016 and 2020, people getting involved in the labor movement and trying to build a base for working class politics in, in a labor movement that is not oriented in that direction. Right. And, and basically to, to try to create a sense of what might be called class struggle unionism. Right. 
Um, not that that's going to be enough, because, of course, unions are always going to be limited in terms of what they can do. They're economic organizations. We need a political organization that can organize across the unions, right? And that and that has the capacity to articulate these different struggles together into one common kind of class-based fight. Um, but I do think it's hopeful, we, you know, that or- socialist organizers are going to the trade unions, trying to go about the task of transforming those organizations from top-down, bureaucratic, institutions that tend to discipline the working class into doing exactly the kinds of politics you've been talking about, right? Vote for Biden every four years and then go home and close your eyes and go to sleep um, into some other kinds of organizations that, that can promote working class struggles, that can deepen the politicization of working class people, that can do the kinds of political education that would mean that people would not be uh, threatening with threatening to go vote for Trump, right? Because political education means people are aware of the issues. They're aware of what's at stake and they know what needs to be done. And those kinds of tasks, the union movement has long since given up by and large. So that needs to be reinvigorated. And and one step is is, is certainly what, what these young activists are doing today, going into the trade union. Yeah. I mean, I hear that my, my rejoinder is, and again, no shade to Sean Fain, but my rejoinder is, well, that's what the UAW was. It They had a, you know, an, an elected representative that wasn't one of these top down business union folks. He did amazing things like, uh, you know, um, endorsing uh, the ceasefire movement, you know, a huge improvement, nine, nine points out of 10. Like I'm not trying to come for Sean Fain, but it does seem like there's a contradiction for me between saying, well, we have to focus on organizing. Isn't labor so wonderful? And uh, it's not going to come from these electoral cycles. But also Sean Fain has to endorse Joe Biden because otherwise Trump is going to win and we're supposed to be deeply committed to these electoral cycles. Yeah. Like. No, I mean, I, I, yeah, no, I think I think more it's it's it, what kind of, you know, what kind of, of 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 labor legislation and regulations can we expect to get from a Trump presidency versus a Biden presidency? No, I've I've heard the argument and even people, friends of mine who made that argument once upon a time are now saying, I don't care. I can't tell people to vote for Biden because of Gaza. No, I know that. You know, I totally, friend, friend yeah. of the show, um, you know, Crystal Ball has made this argument uh, on the show and elsewhere. Or I guess we were together on uh, Crystal and Kyle and Friends. I've had this conversation with her privately, you know, and people have their new red lines. And I'm kind of like, well, with all due respect. Uh, what if, you know, before when other people had different red lines than you, yeah. short of what has been described as a plausible genocide, you said that the labor stuff was more important. And I understand that some of this is relative, but like it seemed to be before Gaza that the that the labor gains alone were forgiving a multitude of sins. Yeah. And why is that still not true? Trump and Biden are neither of whom are going to have good Gaza policy. Why not still tell people to vote for Biden if that's your belief, if that was your belief before, yeah. that labor labor gains were enough? And so I think that there's a lot of conf- – like for me personally, I am happy that people have kind of come toward my direction on this, but I am confused by it. And I think it's worth having a conversation about as a left community because I do think the paucity of red lines has led us – to this point today where it takes a genocide smacking us upside the head before anyone will even consider the possibility of not voting for the Democratic candidate. Yeah. No, I, I very much hear that. And I've obviously been having these same discussions with all my you know, friends and colleagues, et cetera, as well. And, and it's incredibly hard when you have a person who is literally you know, financing a genocide to go to the polls and cast a ballot for that person. I mean, it's it's a situation that to, is, is is very, very difficult to to make the kind of case that people should be going on and voting for this guy. I don't disagree with that. Um, but I also think that, you know, one has to keep in mind what kind of organization the Democratic Party is. This isn't new. Like it was it was Bill Clinton who was behind the largest previous to now post-World War II genocide in East Timor and Indonesia. Right. In the 1990s, right. the massacres of the Kurds, the bombing of Iraq. Right. Bill Clinton dropped more bombs on Iraq than George Bush did. Right. Mm. Um, and so this is not this is nothing new for the Democratic Party to be involved in Obama's mass violence. drone war. Obama's drone. Yeah. War. I always say it takes a Democrat, whether it's <laughs> cutting welfare, doing a war. It takes a Democrat. Yes. Because otherwise there's opposition when there's a Republican in charge. And I'm not saying that they don't do bad, obviously. Yeah. Um, but at least you hear about it. Yeah. No, um, absolutely. And so and so I think we, we this is the kind of organization that it is. And this is why, you know, as you and I are both agreeing, the Democratic Party is not something that we could think of transforming. We don't we don't you know, our politics is not limited to getting a better Democrat. We don't expect them to be anything other than shitty. And so the question is how over the long term, what do we have to do now to be able to get an alternative on the agenda in the long term that is seriously in favor of the kinds of 
political changes that are needed desperately now more than ever with the mounting ecological crisis, right? Every single day gets worse and worse. So we have to do something. We have to, and the Democrats are not going to be it. And it's because, not just because of foreign policy and wars and, ge and genocide in Gaza, it's also because of the complete and utter failure to do anything about climate change, right? Anything yeah. serious about climate change. So how do we get out of this, right? I don't think hoping for a better Democrat is the answer. I don't think hoping for Joe Biden to get better is the answer. We need to fundamentally start building something different. And that is a big project that is a long-term project. And with, I don't think there's a shortcut around it, unfortunately. For, for uh, as getting back to just as before we wrap to the economics of it all, as you are <laughs> an professor, and I know we've gone very far afield into this pol political conversation, but I'm really fixated on this idea of being given something to talk about that's new, this capital control notion. And I do wonder if you could just briefly um, maybe drill down a little bit again into this question I asked earlier of what that looks like and what kind of pushback you receive, because I do wonder if there's a a good faith argument that with Bitcoin and multinational corporations or what have you, that there's various ways to get around efforts to limit capital movement across borders. Is it really possible? If I get on, if I go on rising tomorrow and say, hey, Robbie, um, America first, it has a sort of a good notion, but what they really should be concerned about is capital controls. You know, am I going to get swatted down with a uh, not incorrect argument that says the same way that people argue a wealth tax won't work because people can avoid uh, via tax havens and the like having their wealth tax or they'll just move overseas or what have you, yeah. um, that capital controls are not really a legitimate solution here? Yeah, I mean, they are. They they Implementing capital controls, there will obviously always be loopholes and challenges and weaknesses like with any regulation within capitalism. That's why ultimately... You know, capitalism is not the answer for us, right? As long any reform you implement, there's going to be continuous pushback and attempt to subvert it and undermine it, et cetera, no matter what the reform is. So capital controls are certainly no different in that respect. And that's why they're not enough. We have to go further than that. It's just the first step um, toward, mm -hmm. toward gaining broader, you know, basically the end, the end result, the end goal should be uh, taking over the financial sector and running it as a public utility. Why can't we do mm -hmm. that? I mean, basically at this point, the banking sector is completely 100% supported by the state. The idea that this should be run as a for-profit business is should be seen as anachronistic and pointless because the, the federal mm -hmm. government completely 100% is behind the financial system as it's currently organized. So there's absolutely no justification for it to be run as a private for-profit uh, uh, concern. So the end result should be how do we, how do we take over the financial system, run it as a public utility, and be able to, to send investment, to, to direct investment in accordance with pub, with social and ecological need rather than private profit, right? That's the ultimate end, end goal, I think. But in terms of capital controls as a first step to getting there, you're talking about asserting, increasingly, uh, increasingly asserting public control over what's done with investment, where it moves, when, and, and why. And I think that that is a, is, a, is a first step that's entirely reasonable. We had capital controls in the United States and, and the other advanced capitalist countries in the so-called Bretton Woods system from the 1940s until 1971. And, you know, it wasn't perfect. It had all kinds of problems. And its contradictions ultimately led to its unraveling with the rise of the so-called neoliberal order that we've had since 1979. Um, but nevertheless, as a step toward a deeper and broader uh, public control over investment, I think it's, it's, it's a necessary and perfectly possible first step. Well, what, what were its flaws? And, and can you get into just a little bit briefly? I'm sorry to be doing this here at the end, but I am fascinated by this. How, what were its flaws? And can you explain the choice behind the shift to the neoliberal system? Because right now I'm reminded that, you know, Donald Trump is talking about um, China's trying to build cars in Mexico and it's going to ruin the American auto industry. I'm going to put tariffs on all of these cars. So you're not going to be able to buy any of these Chinese Mexican cars. I mean, he is speaking in these kind of protectionist terms all the time and yeah. it's popular. Yeah. And so I am curious about what our version of that could, would look like. Absolutely. And, and I think exactly laying it out the way that I was just mentioning it is the way to, to do that. In terms of the flaws of the Bretton Woods system, the Bretton Woods system was set up as, as the U.S. empire was first kind of getting on its feet in the, in the wake of World War II. And basically, the Bretton Woods system was intended to promote the international integration and expansion and consolidation of global capitalism. And the way that, that they did that was they needed to, to provide some space for individual states to enact 
policies that were somewhat autonomous from the disciplines of international capital movements. So it was always intended as a step toward deepening the integration of global capitalism, which is what ultimately was culminated with neoliberalism, right? Totally free global capital mobility, right? Capital can move anywhere in the world, basically cost-free, um, wherever profits are the highest. So Bretton Woods was kind of always intended to, as a step in that direction. Now, what it basically did was it tried to differentiate between movements of investment on the one hand and movements of goods on the other hand, right? So it wanted to promote the latter, promote the trade of goods, but limit the flows of investment. And ultimately, that ended up being impossible, not least because as multinational corporations uh, invested abroad, expanded abroad, as they were uh, uh, pushed to do by the federal government, uh, large dollar, large offshore dollar uh, holdings were, were built up in Europe in what was called the euro dollar market, which basically were an unregulated massive amount of dollars just sitting offshore in Europe and therefore exerted a lot of pressure on the ability of the state to, to, in, to enforce the, the, the peg, the dollars pegged to gold at, at whatever it was per ounce. So in, in effect, the, 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 the capital controls regime, the Bretton Woods regime was undermined by the very internationalization of capital that it was aiming to promote, right? By aiming to promote the internationalization of capital, a large a kind of unregulated euro dollar market emerged which, which was able to escape the restrictions that were imposed through the Bretton Woods system. And, and corporations relied on that as they invested in Europe and elsewhere. So if our, if our goal, instead of promoting internationalization, if our goal was to gain control over capital and, and stop uh, corporations from freely investing abroad, well, then we would have a very different orientation toward what capital controls would be doing. And, and theoretically, we would be able to use them as a step toward asserting broader public control over investment. Rather than rather than trying to use them as a way of assisting corporations to international. See, I'm sorry to be so dense about this stuff, but I find this to be so abstract. I mean, when you talk about making it easier to um, uh, trade in goods or to have goods travel across borders, what are the barriers to having goods travel across borders, and how would you? eliminate them to make them easier versus what are we talking about when we're talking about capital investments and how then like logistically do you preclude said investments? Do, do you know what I'm saying? Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. Well, the truth is you, yeah, you can't, right. That's what, Bre that's why Bretton Woods ended up getting into trouble. They wanted to draw that distinction, but determining, you know, concretely what counts as investment and what counts as trade is very hard to do, right. They wanted to promote the, the global, the, expand, the global expansion of free trade of goods and to control the movement of capital. And the, in truth, they couldn't differentiate that in any very specific way. But when we're talking about controlling trade, what are we, are we just talking about tariffs or is yeah. there some other mechanism here? Yeah. So it was, it was, it was eliminating tariffs, right? They, they wanted to eliminate tariffs that would, that would uh, restrict the flow of, of goods internationally, right? To, to eliminate tariffs that would restrict the flow of goods while keeping in place controls, other kinds of controls that would that would that would limit the flow of capital, right? And so there's a difference between between exchanging commodities, whereby country A produces wine, country B produces cars, and they exchange them on the world market, versus country A investing in country B and producing wine in country B in facilities that it owns. I right? see. So it was it was the second form of of internationalization, movement of investment whereby investors in one country open up operations in another country, that was what they wanted to restrict. And, and the truth is, they weren't able to really do so effectively, right? Um, and, and it was that kind of, so, sorry. So how would we do with it? I mean, if it's- Well, because if, we, wouldn't, we wouldn't be interested in promoting capitalist globalization. So we would be imposing restrictions and penalties on capitalists for, for moving anywhere abroad, right? Where, okay, so are we talking tariffs again? Yeah. Tariffs, absolutely. Okay. Tariffs on, on, on moving goods and, and, and certainly restrictions on moving capital. So if you want to move capital internationally, you have to pay penalties, pay fees, pay taxes, right? And, and that's so just- is, is, Trump, is Trump wrong about this uh, China-Mexican car stuff? Uh, well, I mean, what Trump is saying- Maybe I should ask it differently. Is Trump right <laughs> about this stuff? I mean, if you take him at his word- He's saying things that are not that different from what the left might say or should say, right? Um, yeah. At least on those particular issues. But of course, he's not serious about that. And if you look at the USMCA, 
uh, you know, which was Trump's so-called new NAFTA. It's really not that different from from the original NAFTA. And in fact, all most of the original supporters of the first NAFTA ended up coming around and backing it because they saw it as kind of a better deal for American MNCs. Um, so I think, you know, the big difference is that that the left has to not just say these things, but also build the forces, the class forces necessary to bring it about. Right. Trump. I mean, even if he wanted to roll back globalization, even if he was totally earnest about wanting uh, uh, to, to change the, the, the balance of trade, right? The U.S. trade balance. Even if he was totally earnest about that, he can't do it. He, he can't do it. There's no way. Globalization is deeply institutionalized. He's not going to have a fight with capital on the scale that would be needed to roll that back. They're profiting from this like crazy, right? What, where is he going to get the capacity? Where is he going to get the forces to have that kind of fight with capital? Not, not, no yeah, but. It- but it's also wild that he's willing to commit to that rhetorically, yeah. even if it's only rhetorical. And there isn't even a rhetorical pushback. Yeah. I mean, this is where we get back to the the, the the discussion we were having a little while ago, where my feeling is that maybe out of desperation or in the absence of the alternative, I do wish we lived in a world where when Trump says uh, Mexico car tariffs, if Biden isn't willing to say it because he's completely captured by capital interests, then at least uh, AOC or Ilhan Omar or whomever is willing to say, hey, the response, Trump is right about this, but he's not willing to do it. And look at look at his trade policy and how bad it was. He's been in office for four years. This isn't like 2016. We have proof that he's lying. And here's what we propose instead. Yeah. You know? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> no, I mean, I think I think the left should be talking about as the main thing that we're pushing for climate related reforms and capital controls. Until we have capital controls, limiting the, limiting capital's ability to exit at will, the working class is always going to be at a disadvantage. It's going to be a disadvantage at the workplace, and it's going to be a disadvantage politically, right? Because ultimately, capital has the trump card. They can invest somewhere else. And every working class person knows that. Like, I've worked with auto workers in Oshawa, Ontario, organizing around various different issues over, over the years that I lived in Canada. And every person knows that if they ask for too much, they're, they're going to face the loss of their jobs and the closure of their facilities, which yeah. is actually happening. And it's happening in Detroit. And the fact that, that Joe Biden isn't stopping this is the reason why those working class people are looking to Trump, right? Like we were talking about earlier. And so the only yeah. way that this can be stopped is if we tell capital, you can't just freely exit. And then the, alter- the only alternative that they have is to, is to somehow negotiate with their workers, right? And they're going to have to make concessions, right? So the, the, the first step toward building working class people's power is... is is capital controls. That would be a really, really important, I think, reform. And that's what we should be talking and about. Steve, I, I'm loving this because this feels productive and new. And it's like it's giving me new ammunition and new ways to think about how to build arguments. But my last question about this is, are we going to get pushback with folks saying this is going to make your goods more expensive? You love your cheap Chinese goods. You love your, you know, um, avocados from Mexico, whatever. Yeah. Um, those aren't cheap. But, you know, like, and, and that, you know, Americans are too, um, and, and you talked about this in the other podcast as well, the kind of um, uh, kind of mixed relationship that workers have to capital. Yeah. Um, yeah. And how that complicates uh, forming these class coalitions. Yeah. People as both consumers and workers. And in this instance, you know, are people going to be turned off if we were or commit to one of these this this capital controls argument by the idea that you know are my wages going to go up before the price of everything goes up because we can no longer import cheap goods? Yeah, yeah. I mean, so so you're you're hitting on an important issue here, which is that you know globalization, as is the tendency of capitalism generally, you know, has enormously cheapened commodities that people buy, right? But but over over, over the you know over the course of the decades in which we've seen the current round of globalization happening. Uh, working class people's wages have, in real terms, still declined more, right? So working class people have not benefited proportionately from the cheapening of commodities. So if there was a little inflation, if if capital controls were to result in a little inflation, what are you really talking about here? If working class people are getting, if wages are going up, right? And because capital controls have empowered people at the workplace to get a better deal from their bosses. Okay. Working class wages are going up, so maybe corporations raise the price. Unless everybody at every layer of the income distribution increases their own salaries proportionate to the gains at the bottom, distribution is changing, right? Mm. Yeah, so you have a little inflation. 
but real wages at the bottom of the distribution are still going to be higher, right? Unless every single layer of the, of the income distribution increases their salary proportionately, even if there's inflation, what you're really, you know, which is harmless effectively, you're really looking at redistribution, right? So the, mm. the, 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 the threat of inflation in that respect should be totally seen as what it is, which is, which is a, a, a canard, a, a red herring uh, conjured up by the right to basically say everything from increasing the minimum wage to much more drastic reforms like capital controls are going to be a disaster for working people. I mean, sometimes inflation is a disaster for working people. But if that inflation was simply reflecting redistribution, whereby people's wages at the bottom are going up and people at the top are making less, like there's only one pie of total national income, right? And what really matters is how that pie is divided between different levels of the income distribution. So if what we're really seeing is a redistribution to the bottom, even if prices go up a little bit, who cares, right? People at the mm. you know, working people have still seen it. Well, you're squeezing the middle class and those are the voters. And that's who, I mean, that, I mean, I'm just thinking from a political perspective, but where this is going to go, like what the counter argument is going to be. What is the middle? What is the middle class? The middle class was built, you know, initially on the back of the, uh, on, uh, in the moment of the post-war Keynesian compromise, right? In which, uh, trade unions won important victories for working people. Yeah, there's a bunch of middle managers and stuff. The middle class is a very amorphous term, but a significant part of the middle class and a significant part of its decimation has come from globalization, right? Mm. As as yeah, wages have stagnated or declined for 40 years for most people. So the erosion of the middle class is very much about the defeat of the working class. And the only way the middle class, quote unquote, is ever going to have a chance of being rebuilt is if we start thinking about how to empower labor a little bit more. Yeah, this is great. Steve, thank you so much for joining us today. I found this very stimulating and very informative, and I appreciate you going a couple rounds of um, Are the Squad Bad Actually, <laughs> which is a recurring theme no, I, of this podcast. You've been a good sport. I love I love the discussion. Honestly, these are the kinds of conversations we need to be having a lot more of in a serious way, you know, really. And too, too often it's superficial. Yeah, well, thank, thank you again. And please do tell our audience where they can find more of your work um, and including your book. Okay, yeah. Uh, so my new book uh, co-authored with Scott Aquano is called The Fall and Rise of American Finance. And the book talks a lot about uh, how the financial system in the US has developed between the you know early uh, 20th century and today, and including you know the all the stuff around globalization that we've been discussing. Um, and I'm the co-editor of the Socialist Register where we put out an annual volume dealing with a range of different, um, you know, topical political matters. Uh, and certainly a lot of the discussion we've been having here uh, happens in those pages as well. So people would be interested in that, I think. I'm definitely going to have to check it out. Steve Marr, thank you again. Thank you to the audience for listening to this episode. You know that you can listen to an additional episode of Bad Faith every week on Mondays if you subscribe at patreon.com slash badfaithpodcast. You can get a clip of those premium episodes on uh, YouTube if you are bad faith curious but not willing to commit as of yet. Thanks again for supporting this podcast. Take care of yourselves. And as always, keep the faith. Hey, YouTube. Thanks for watching. Just a reminder that this is a podcast. You can catch an extra premium episode every Monday for $5 a month at patreon.com slash podcast. That's patreon.com slash podcast for $5 a month, an extra episode every week. Additionally, please do consider liking this video, subscribing to this channel. It helps us out. It helps independent media beat the algorithm. We appreciate you. And as always, keep the faith.